Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful intro. And again, thank you all for coming out on a Saturday morning to learn about Ha Ha Trick You. Um, no, this is not a cooking class, but I am starting, we are starting with broccoli and tofu to talk about all of the different things we're trying to say in our writing. Because in this broccoli and tofu, there are so many vitamins and so much protein, but if you put them out there on the table like that back there, for example, you might find that not very many people will consume it. So we're trying to think about here about how do we translate all those ideas that are up in our head, those full of vitamins and protein of all the important things we can say, don't push the metaphor, Robin, um, and get it down on the page. So to do that, you do want to have some prep, just like cooking. So before you get started, you need to physically and mentally prepare yourselves for writing. You want to clear your workspace, clear your brain. Maybe that looks like emptying your desk or organizing your bedroom or wherever it is you're going to write, lighting some incense, really preparing yourself um, to have the significant amount of time necessary to devote to the writing that you're going to create because it deserves your time. And if you have a scattered brain, you're not going to be able to produce anything uh, you know, coherent or of worth. So the first thing we do in terms of prep after clearing our space is to look for examples of what we're writing, right? Because just like cooking, if you're cooking for two, that's going to be different than cooking for 10, right? So if you're writing something that you know, say an artist statement where they've given you 150 words, you don't want to set out and have your first draft to be 500 words because that's leftovers art, it doesn't work anymore. So on the right, I have a screenshot. This is a, from a Facebook event page, as you can see, from the Fry Art Museum. And I, I put this here because you can see um, that there's a very specific format. You almost only have five words, OK, to say what your event is. Because writing starts with the short, right? You might be writing an event title, so just to start there. Here's your format on Facebook. And what I think is really interesting about this screenshot of this page is that if you look at the way they've crafted all of these workshop titles, poetry and activism, educator workshop, and on dementia, care, community, and creativity, artist talk, gentrification of the black female body, it's like 15, 20 words. And how much do you know now about this organization and the kind of programming they have? Never mind the pictures that they put next to it. Right, so when you get started to actually write, you want to think about close looking. So have the object or an image of the object, what it is that you're going to be writing about, have it in front of you so you can reference it often. Um, and you also want to spend quality time with it. So when you're looking at it, consider the essential qualities. You know, how does it look? What color is its shape? All of these descriptive ways of looking and engaging with something. But also, how does it make you feel? What is the mood that it evokes? Uh, you know, what is the, the viewer experience like? So whether it's immersive or it's participatory, what, as a viewer, how are you engaging with it or experiencing it? And then, of course, think about the five senses. Something else I want to add here is a lot of the times when you're at this early stage of writing, you can feel blocked, right, by thinking, oh, I don't know how to begin with this. And I think this is the moment where you can just free write it all out and use these descriptive uh, prompts to cleanse yourself of all of that muck at, that starts at the beginning. And then at the end, you know, you can go in and edit and refine and, and find what you wanted to say out of it. But you got to start uh, with spending time with it. Good advice. So then we want to do a little research because there's so many different kinds of texts that we're writing, right? So first of all, who is this for? Is it for your Instagram or is it a grant application where it will be read primarily by people inside your field, right? Is it your thesis or is it something, is it a press release? 
Um, so that determines a little bit of how you're writing in terms of whether you're writing for the general public or the art world insider. Then it, you want to have all your information, right? So if there is a press release you're working off, great, someone else did that work. The artist bio, the artist website, that's always going to be your best source, right? The original source rather than going to someone else's writing where you don't really know necessarily, right? You've got your checklist and then you're going to have some chosen resources that you're using. So for example, say that you're writing about an, an artist who's um, referencing certain ancient civilizations around the world. You want to think about where you're going. You don't want to take anything for granted and think about where you're getting this information and just have kind of go-to places because those kind of things save a lot of time. If you say, okay, I'm going to take most of my spellings off of the MoMA website, just for an example, then each time you get to this problem, you'll be, okay, we're going there. That's just a, a small example. Planning your text. <clears throat> so this is kind of a, a template that we have for all writing. And it's kind of logical, because it says that writing has a beginning, middle, and an end, right? Makes sense, right? So if you're writing something short, like an Instagram, where you have, say, 10 words before the more, you want to put the essential information at the top, right? If it's an essay, you want to keep them reading, we want to start with a way to lead them in. And this is one of the main differences between the, you know, expository writing that we're doing here in the art world and in more academic writing. Because in academic writing, it's kind of like, I'm about to tell you these five things. Here's the first thing I'm telling you, and then there's four things coming, and then I told you this first thing, and now there's, this is the second one of the five type of thing. And we're not doing this here because we're writing, we're thinking about the audience, right? That's why we're looking at our art, even though we're the ones who made it, and thinking about the way that the audience experiences it, because that's part of the translation that has to happen to get it into words and sentences, right? Then you have the middle. You've seen this all in a press release or an announcement where they'll give you examples of certain kinds of work, for example, in this painting, for example, in this room, and so on. And then you get to the end. The end is going to sum up and maybe it's going to deliver you someplace else, right? It might be a call to action that you want to do something. You want to go to the show. You want to go out in the streets and protest and so on. It might circle back to the beginning, and good writing often does. It comes to a natural stop, so you don't keep scrolling on the page and saying, was that the end? And it tells you why you just invested how many ever seconds or minutes. Why did you do that? Why did I spend this time, right? Because there's a couple things. One thing is that the writing, reading of the writing, we don't want to be just like eating tofu. We want not, I love tofu. I'm just saying. No, she doesn't. <laughs> but we want the experience of reading to be pleasant too. But we want to have spent our time getting more than an experience because we're reading for information, right? We're trying to get a takeaway about why something is interesting. Why does this art exist in the world, right? And that's kind of what we're going for here. Now, with art writing, we have some other criteria that we're throwing in here. The first thing is literally, what is this about? And we say this because there's so many times that we see press releases and artist statement where it starts with the kind of this art is about my investigation of climate change. Very laudable, all good. Okay, now that, I'm gonna say one thing about it, and again, no shade on this, is that that probably describes a lot of people, right? So you're not really quite getting into your distinctive, the, the, what's original or distinctive about your art, and it's also like, okay, why are you, why aren't you writing an article type of thing? So the first thing is literally, what is this made of? Is it a mixed media piece? Is it a performance art? Is it a participatory piece? Right up at the top, whatever it is. Then you're going to talk about your process and materials, because we'll be talking about this more later. But um, even in this work that we're looking at here, the different elements of how this was created with different found materials and, and so on tells you so much about the meaning. So the deeper you go into the process, you getting more and more specific about your materials, the less work you'll have to do when you get to the part, what does this mean, right? What is my 
longer goal in bringing this into the world in terms of all the ideas. So this kind of, and I describe it as a loving description sometimes, and this is very hard when it's your own art, right? Because you're thinking about how people are looking at it. And I'm just like, take your time, do that technique that Alex was talking about, and just look at it lovingly, right? But they just say, what is Savor it? Savor it. Pardon? Savor it. Right, savor it, all right? And, and, and then, only then, usually, we get to this meaning proposition and the intention behind the work. And again, this is just a template. There's no one way to do it. But it becomes a very useful format. And you're gonna, we're going to be showing you some examples. And now that you've seen it, I think you're going to go out and when you're reading reviews and essays, you're going to start to notice this kind of template out there um, in the wild, so to speak, of writing. So the first thing I want to think about is who made this identity, right? So there's a lot of different descriptions of identity. And I say this, too, because I can't remember if we took the slide out. We don't want to assume that people know who people are, right? A lot of times that happens where you're like, oh, the general audience heard of this. Well, no, not necessarily. People you know, come from all different backgrounds. So how can you situate yourself of the artist rather than say, like, maybe where they're from, where they live, a kind, you know, if they're a part of a collective or a movement. And then again, since you know, a lot of people are not just an artist these days, this idea that someone might also be a writer or an educator or a performer, just giving us some aspects of their identity that we can connect with. Then we get to the subject we're talking about. What is it, literally? Now think about this. The minute you say porcelain, or alpaca, right? If you say something's woven with alpaca instead of silk, you're situating it in a place in the world, right? That's a certain material from a certain region used in a certain way to make certain objects for certain uses. So the deeper you get in terms of all that, think about wood. Think about using plywood versus bamboo or maple and all the meanings that come with that in terms of geography and history and culture, right? Then what is it, right, literally? Is it a picture of a person? I know there's a lot of art in between, but is it a picture of a person? Is it a portrait of a place? Is it a landscape? Is it based on older art or other art? And then if it's, you know, maybe it's from now, but when it was made in the past is also so relevant, um, of course, to what it means. Objecthood. We just left this as description and experience because we're kind of, um, We've kind of been talking about it. My other advice is this: like, say you're writing about someone else's art, um, you know, or for an assignment. That, as they say, you know, eyewitness reports are notoriously unreliable. So you've got to keep looking at the thing. You've got to keep looking at an image of the thing when you're writing to connect with those essential qualities and to think again about not just the ideas that you're so excited to convey, but how those ideas are being delivered in the art so that you can explain it from all the perspectives you can. Finally, the why, right? So this is this intention. Maybe you made this work to put beauty into the world at a time of so much trouble, right? Um, to create beauty in some way or to challenge our perception of beauty. So much work is made to challenge perceptions, right? It might be made to bring visibility to a group or culture that's been left out of mainstream histories, for example, or to share a point of view or in the sense of social practice art to inspire an action, right? To get people to go out and help or, or, or do an action in some way in terms of a mission. And finally, this is so important in press, in getting press. Why now? Why should I care about this now? With all the other things that are happening in the world, what is it about this right now? Set the work in the current moment. In journalism, there's kind of this saying, at a time when, that we use a lot, right? At a time when this, this art does that, right? It doesn't have to be that turn of phrase, but it's a good concept, right? Um, maybe it's because it's doing something new. It's using a kind of new technique. It has some ideas that it's bringing to the fore, or it's offering a solution, right? I need to see this now because it's giving me a new way in to see something, to experience something. 
section three, crafting your text. So here are some slides that we're showing of um, some examples of some writing. So you can see how the writing template works in action. So on the right, you see a screenshot. This is from an Instagram from the Ford Foundation Gallery. And the artist's name is Thenmoji Sundararajan. And she is working, I guess I'm just going to read it to you. A Dalit woman, her name unknown, her image adapted from a historical photo and repro reproduced on a copper plate. So right there, who is it, right? So it's relevant that she's from the group formerly known as Untouchable. No one knows her name. Someone had a photo of her, so the photo is now being reused, right, to give her a new identity. So we've already learned who is it, how are they depicted, why is it on a copper plate? Because that's how they made the legal text that controlled the bodies and movement of her caste, right? To fix our gaze on the human face of discrimination and on the structures that keep it in place, right? So it's kind of, who is it, what has it made it, how did they do it? Why did they use these materials? And what's the kind of call to action or takeaway that we, the readers, will have? And we can see the way that the writing is connecting the process and the materials to the intention, right? Because a lot of time when we're working with these artist statements, sometimes we get you know, this beautiful abstraction. And then in the last two sentences, there's something about climate change and migration, and again, no shade, so much art is about that, but if you, if you want that to be the subject that's the intention, you gotta set it up along the way and give, and, and give different clues and hints to take them with you where you're going. Absolutely, and before you get to that, you always want to start with the basics first. So you want to answer the who, the where, and the what. Here we have an example from artist Micheline Thomas, and in her artist statement, essentially she starts with, New York-based artist Micheline Thomas is best known for her elaborate paintings composed of rhinestones, acrylic, and enamel. So immediately we know where she's located, New York, we know what she's known for, the elaborate paintings, and we're getting some more uh, visual description there. It's made, she's, she works with rhinestones, acrylic, and enamel. So we're getting a visual picture of what we can expect from her work. And as a reporter, if I'm reading this, I immediately know, okay, well, I can ask about what the meaning of the rhinestones are, or the acrylic, why she chose to use these materials. Um, it goes on, uh, we can read here, uh, Micheline Thomas makes paintings, collages, photography, video, and installations that draw on art history and pop popular culture to create a contemporary vision of female sexuality, beauty, and power. So this is going into the why that Robin was talking about. Here we're getting into the importance of her work and the significance behind it. Again, as a reporter, which is always the perspective I'm going to bring to this, I immediately want to know what the significance of the artist's work is and what um, issues are they thinking about when they're making their work because I can always bring that into the interview and it'll help me situate it within the context of the current moment. So we can keep reading, blurring the distinction between object and subject, concrete and abstract, real and imaginary. Thomas constructs complex portraits, landscapes, and interiors in order to examine how identity, gender, and sense of self are informed by the, way, by the ways women and feminine spaces are represented in art and popular culture. So that's a really long sentence, but you're immediately getting you know, what this artist is trying to grapple with. And you immediately know it's not just a beautiful, stunning portrait. You know she's trying to bring in some meat into this, and she's really thinking about the, uh, the ideas of gender and sexuality that we deal with in society every single day and that art has been struggling to, to capture and talk about forever. So important to think about when you're writing your, your bios. Um, exactly, and just another point about this, that this whole blurb is probably about 150 words. It's actually really hard, 
right? To, to sum up your whole practice in 150 words, oh my god, right? But so that's why you start to get to these basics. What are the paintings of? What do they depict? Well, some are abstract and some are figurative. What are the figuratives? Portraits, landscapes, and interiors, right? And if, the, if you want to go deep, you know, like what, if, when I'm working in the statements, what kind of interiors? Are they the kitchen, you know, or the, you know, the family room? You can just go deeper and deeper. And the other point I want to make about this is also what we call in journalism display copy, right? The bigger letters, guess what? Everyone, this is your own psychology too. You're going to read what's in the biggest letters and at the top first, right? So, you know, you might call it your tagline or your catchphrase, but a lot of times on your website, you might just have a photo in your name. And I'm just like, I don't know, like sometimes a tagline on the front page of the website, that's where the first, that's the first place people are coming. You ever look to see how many people pass by that and just like leave or go deeper? Try a tagline. The what leads to the why. So here's another case. This is an Instagram post by Eugenie Sai. She's a curator at the Brooklyn Museum. And this has the whole writing template in one sentence. So I really like it. The abstract patterns and vibrant palette. So right there, we're getting this abstraction in the color of Rico Gatson's new paintings on panel, when they were made, what they're of, delight the eye, viewer experience, and suggest the possibility of other realities that lie beyond the physical world, right? That's this idea, why does this abstraction list exist in the world? To take us to another place. So if you think about it, every part of this sentence, right, from what it's made of, what it looks like, the viewer experience, and the impact on the viewer is all there in one sentence. Right? And it's so important to think about that when we're trying to promote our art because it's not necessarily the first thing that's going to come to mind. So here we are again with Artist Bio and exactly what Robin was saying, you want to try and make your main point in 150 words. Anything more than that as a journalist you know, or a viewer coming into the Artist Bio, you might lose the attention span um, and you might end up going overboard with information. So here we have Kanupa Hanska Luger, uh, born on the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota. So here we already know where the artist was born uh, in North Dakota, New Mexico. Based artist Kanupa Hanska Luger is an enrolled member of the three affiliated tribes of Fort Berthold and is of Mandan, Hidatsa, Arikara, and Lakota heritage. So we, we have a good understanding of the artist's background, we know where they're coming from, and we can already start to infer some things about their experience and what the art might be about. Um, creating monumental installations, sculpture, and performance to communicate urgent stories about 21st century indigeneity, Luger incorporates ceramics, steel, fiber, video, and repurposed materials to activate speculative fiction, engage land-based actions of repair and practice empathetic response, and practice empathetic response through social collaboration. So again, another big chunky sentence um, that maybe some folks would say is a run-on, but ultimately you're getting everything that you need from that one sentence. You're knowing, you know that they create, they're, create, they're making installations, they're making sculpture and performance, so you're thinking about what is it that this artist does? And then why are they doing it? Well, because they need to communicate urgent stories about 21st century indigeneity. So here we're getting into the why and the why it's important. And then we are getting into how is, it, how is this artist doing that and how are they achieving this goal? By incorporating all of these different uh, materials and these different uh, forms with repurposed materials to activate speculative fiction and essentially do all of this through social collaboration. So when you're writing something like this about your own work, it, I feel like it's significant to really think about what is it that your work is doing, how are you doing it, and why are you doing it, right? So breaking it down into those, uh, you know, who, what, where, when, why questions, I think is very helpful. And then this continues, Luger combines critical cultural analysis 
with dedication and respect for the diverse materials, environments, and communities he engages while provoking diverse audiences to engage with indigenous peoples and values apart from the lens of colonial social structuring. This is important because it tells you about what's important to the artist. So you're understanding that they are very much considering the politics behind the work and they want that to be included um, in the conversation, in the conversations that their artwork is a part of. So again, if I'm reading this, I'm immediately going to go into an interview and ask them about all of these things and bring that into the story. And, and I, I think, think it's, it's also a useful example. Um, a lot of times people say, Robin, I have so many different, I do so many different things. Every project is so different than I do with me and materials. How do I sum it up? And I say, there must be some essential quality that's uniting all this. Maybe it is that it's participatory or collaborative or, or some kind of you know, transcendental abstraction. I'm just riffing now, right? But that's what's going to interest people if you just say, I'm a painter, printer, sculptor, photographer, and installation maker, and they, want, they, and they come away with that, there's not really anything that sticks, right? That's so, that could describe so many different people. So this kind of point of view and these essential qualities are very key to communicate. Yeah, absolutely. The point of view is essential because that's what's going to separate you from other artists perhaps grappling with the same issues or using similar materials. So here's another example of the template in use in just two sentences. Um, so this is a, a tweet from MoMA from some time ago. They had this huge show of Cezanne drawings. Now the first thing about what we call this the call to action, right? A lot of times it's tempting to say two weeks left, one week left, two days left. Oh, all right, you get the idea. The point is there's a lot of things that are closing on all these days that you're flagging. So again, we're back to this idea of the why. Now, what you start to see in these good call to action, if I might, is that it's this kind of idea, again, of experience. He's a pretty famous artist, Cezanne, right? See through Paul Cezanne's eyes. Pretty compelling, right? It's not, it's not didactic. It's not like, come and you must see this is a famous person. It's see through Paul Cezanne's eyes. Step into this world. You're going to, now that I've mentioned this, you're going to start to see this in a lot of places. Now, here it comes. More than 200 works in pencil and kaleidoscopic watercolor. That one lovely adjective helping out so much. From when? Across his career. What else? Along with key paintings, the famous ones that you all know and love and thought you knew, will reveal how drawings shape the artist's transformative modern vision. That's a lot of information, right? And again, we get this idea that you were going to have a takeaway. Not that you've now seen the largest show of drawings by this guy confirming what you knew about his awesomeness, but you're going to get a sense into the person's brain because that's what you do from drawing, right? It's kind of this direct connection to their artistry in a certain way. So here are a few tips. Um, if you're having trouble writing about your work, I know I've had artists come to me and ask for help writing their artist bios, and the biggest problem is they're so involved in it and they're so, so much a part of it that it's difficult to describe it in plain language, right? Um, that could be intelligible for folks not involved with the art or didn't know the art from the early inception period. So advice, pretend it's somebody else's. Try and get yourself into a third person perspective and imagine that you are walking into a gallery and seeing it for the first time. And a way to do that is to go back to what we started with and think about describing it visually, describing it from the five senses and in a very just basic way. What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? What is, how can you describe your work in the most layman terms to somebody else? And it can help you get outside of your own mind and the personal connection you may have with the work that's prohibiting you from presenting it to other people. 
And another tip, so you want to make sure that you're keeping language active. Avoid the passive tense because that's going to make it seem as if the work is happening to somebody else or happening to you as opposed to you creating the work, right? So say you make, you perform, not that the pra not that it's the practice being about something. So I created um, or I, I created a work of art with uh, you know tessellated diamonds as opposed to um, the tessellated diamonds were on the the tapestry. Exactly. What about criticism? So when you when it comes to rating our reviews, we still have to say the who, what, where, when, and why, right? So we just we just wrote same art writing template. Now, it's kind of challenging when you're writing a, a review because you want to consider the art and you want to also consider the show, right? And those can be two totally different things. You can go into a Cezanne show and say, um, well, he was great, but they were hung too close together and um, they were hung too high and I couldn't see it and it repeated a lot of information and it was just too big or whatever. I mean, you have to back it up with what you said, but so you might be considering the formal qualities of the work. Is it, you know, beautiful or to look at? Was it, you know, is their artistry incredible? Is it super detailed? Does it have this powerful message, originality? Um, is it funny? Is it gorgeous type of thing, right? So we're trying to say again, how, is, you know, does it do that? And then we consider the show again, how is it present, presented? They said what it was about a thing. Was it, did that really fulfill what they said? Um, was it a good experience to go through from space to space? You'll see the reviews kind of take you through space to space in the show, which is also very good for press release. Um, meaning in the current moment and impact, and then in the end, worth seeing. Now, I do want to say this, is that we all read reviews for entertainment, right? I read reviews all the time of TV and movies I have no intention to see, because again, the review, just like all writing, is, is for the reader as well, right? But we still want to kind of give an idea, you know, you want in like the best of all possible worlds, if you could see anything, would it be worth seeing, right? Or did you just learn everything you need from the review? Hopefully not, right? So, you know, we're still trying to use the review. I knew I would do that. Um, <laughs> the review is a service to the reader, right? You're, you know, you're kind of like, so we, just, we want to make sure before we start saying if it's good or bad, we can signal that at the top, right? Because the top, you know, we're kind of signaling where we're going when we start. But if we, if we just look and say, this show is terrible and the art is terrible, I don't know why I should care because you didn't tell me what it was. Like. So when we are writing criticism, writing a review, we want to, again, engage the senses. And going back to what we were talking about right before with regards to being active, this also ties into what Robin just said, you want to bring the reader in. You want to make them feel like they are experiencing that exhibition or that gallery or that show with you there because it's going to bring them into the show and it's also going to help convince them to your point whether they should see it or maybe they shouldn't see it. So here's an example that we pulled, um, and no painter's air is better, and it, it, sorry, this is from uh, the Washington Post, Sebastian Smee on Chardin, Chardin. And no painter's air is better to breathe than Chardin's. To stand in front of one of his uncannily calm and self-possessed still lifes after navigating galleries of shrieking show-offy, got cut off there, but you see here in that one sentence, you immediately get a sense of what it's like to encounter that painting in the space which it can be seen. It's, it feels like a breath of fresh air, and I'm not even there. I'm not seeing it, and I know that this is probably going to be a very nice exhibit to walk into. It's going to be peaceful. It's going to be... Um, a breath of fresh air. No air is better to breathe than journals. That's a beautiful sentence. So you're describing the experience of seeing it, and it connects to a takeaway. So here it says, of course, the really marvelous thing with Chardon is that when you get close, you can see more or less how it's done. So now we're also talking about the technical aspect of the work. 
The painted marks are open enough for you to feel the drag of his brush. So the art, the, the viewer, the writer was not necessarily there when this was being painted, and yet seeing it made them think about how it was painted. And now they are painting that picture and communicating that to us as a reader, which is beautiful, right? Because the brush is open, it's not tight, it's... um you can get a sense of it. It's painting the picture for you without even having to see it. The paint, uh, and, it's, and it's this, as much as Chardon's subtle orchestration of texture, tone, and color that creates the feeling of air around his objects and around the painting itself. It's air you want to breathe. And so finishing on that last sentence, uh, this, this writer, Smee, is really selling this work to you and selling the gallery to you because it's describing what you're going to see, it's describing how you're going to feel it, how you're going to feel when you engage with it, and at the end of the day, it's something that they want you to see. So if you're writing criticism, always bring that description, that immersive experience, and tie it into whether or not you recommend people go do this. Good advice, and a lot of these cues can work for your artist statement too, right? You know, when we talk about stimulating the five sentences, you might say, oh, well, I'm just doing painting. What are, you know, but here we have, the, you know, we have the sense of smell, we have the sense of taste, we have texture, but, you know, the sense of touch is stimulated by looking at texture, right? Well, we don't have sound, but you could see how sound might be. The other thing I like to think about, you know, when you're writing an artist statement is to get them to kind of picture you in the studio, just the way he did here. Working at their studio, I mean, wherever your studio is in the world, could be outside too, wherever. Working in their studio, they're doing this. And I like to say this for a few things. The first thing is that I like to call the studio visit the ask you can do. You don't really want to say to a dealer, give me a show. You don't want to say to a writer, write about my art. But you can kind of say, will you visit my studio, right? It's like, kind of like it's an ask you can actually do. So it makes sense in your statement and in your social media to show the studio as this place of transformation, right? The place that you want to be. It's why all the rest of us are in this business, is to see this, you know, these humble materials, whatever they are, transformed into art. So, and, you know, and that's like, again, what happens is that many artists, when they do their statement, get kind of tied up into this intentionality and meaning. And, and what we're saying here is this kind of sensuous aspect of it, of this idea of creation, right? Of kind of being able to incorporate that, that summoning of the creation into the writing can be super helpful in explaining what you're doing. Absolutely. I think a studio visit is probably the most welcome ask for a journalist because you're able to see what their inspirations are, what their methods are, what the process looks like, and you bring that into the writing in a way that fully paints the picture of what that artist is doing, what they're about, and it's incredibly important. Also, I think we do get sound out of this. If you can feel the air around the objects, to me, that feels like a sense of stillness, right? Quiet, maybe. Uh, good point, yeah. Definitely sound. See, it has it all. And finally. So some more tips. Uh, when you're writing, always think about accessibility. So uh, folks might be hard of hearing or blind, and you always want to make sure that you have alt text, especially on social media posts, maybe on your website. Uh, and the alt text just helps to create a visual description of what the image is showing. So if it's a, a, a static image, you would describe what's going on what you can see, and then if it's a video, you would describe what you're seeing and what you're hearing, what the people in the video are doing, um, or what's happening in the video in general. Um, and then also outside of um, accessibility, you also want to think about, in your writing, folks may not have access to an image while they're reading what you have on your art artist bio or in anything that you're writing. Uh, so even in the last slide, we didn't have pictures of those works, and yet I still think they conveyed a sense of what the art looked like and what it felt like. So that's what you want to have in mind. Think, if someone doesn't, can't see what my art looks like, how can I make them feel what it looks like, or how can I paint that picture for them through my words? Beautifully said, yes. And if you are, um, at a, say you're at a panel of Miami artists, right, and they're reading um, your bio like we just heard, 
they're not necessarily going to be art there, right? You're just kind of sitting up on the chair like this, listening to your bio. So again, that's where this descriptive language comes in so that people get the sense of who you are. And it's better, you know, like we're saying, like, it's better to say some powerful things than trying to say everything. Like, no, you know, no shade on the printmaking practice, like, but, you know, like, not, it, that could be your main practice, so great, all good. Um, but it's, you know, instead of, like, listing every single type of thing that you make, which we're not going to remember anyway, it's kind of a, this idea of what is going to make the impact in their mind that they can see. To want to know more, right, before I get to this, because the, the whole point of this writing is this, whether it's on your Instagram or your website. I am so happy if I'm wrong about this, but in most cases, people aren't just going to look at your Instagram or your statement and buy your art or offer you a show. Please DM me. I'm always happy to hear when I'm wrong. In most cases, the action that they're taking, your desired audience, right, that's going to help your career is going to be to get more information, to sign up for your website, to maybe, you know, sign up for your, uh, rather your email email newsletter, right, to, to, to try and do that studio visit. The actions are small, right? So this is, we're trying to think about how can we get them to do an action, not how we're trying to tell them everything ever about us, if that makes sense. Now, just to look at this slide again, we already addressed some of these issues, but words can go such a long way, especially when you got that 150 word space, right? So, you know, we did kind of say this, but you know, any kind of material that you're using from nature brings a geographical history, a cultural history, right? It might have a history in colonization. You know, many people obviously are using these kind of things in the work. So how can you draw that out? And again, if you're making art with wood, and it's a lot of kind of wood, all good. But if you are using wood from a certain place in the world, or fruit trees, that's very different than using plywood. Plywood's a statement, right? A very specific statement because it's a certain kind of processed wood. I actually don't know what it is, but we're just gonna skip on that for a minute. All right, adjectives. We saw one of my favorite adjectives, kaleidoscopic, earlier, because it's just so helpful. And again, we don't gotta go all 60s with 600 adjectives here, even though it's fun, right? But think about the difference between saying a tropical landscape and just writing landscape. Right? Speaks volumes, the one word. Or everyone knows what an imaginary landscape is, or if you have colors that are electric or tranquil. Again, if it works. But th this is what we're talking about, just kind of situ you know, making, you know, painting this image in your mind. You just said that. You know, that's such a good way to say it. Verbs. Keep them active without drawing attention to them. Where we love the verbs is in the process. When we think about Jackson Pollock spinning and flinging and painting and dripping and everything he was doing, those kind of verbs work great for us when we're doing our statements, writing about process and so on. But in this kind of writing, we're trying to draw attention to the art, not the writing, right? So we don't need to be writing he proclaims and she declares and whatnot, if that makes sense, because we're just trying to um, use them to get another point out. If you have to cut your text, just cut the adverbs. You're welcome. And um, avoid, <laughs> avoid superlatives. That means when you're writing about yourself and you say that it's the best, or, or even about another show, and you say it's the best every time, or that the person's the top this or that, you know, people are kind of cynical these days, and just because you say it's not going to be true. So if someone's using a word like that to say, you know, how brilliant you are, maybe quoting other, you know, described as such and such, but maybe about yourself, you want to save it um, for certain occasions. I just want to add that when we're looking at this, it's important to remember that every part of the process and every word you choose has meaning. So every product that you're using, every material that you're using, it has a, a significance, a context, and a meaning and a purpose. And it's important to be as specific as you can possibly be about what you're using. And just as specific as you're being with that, be specific with your word choice when you're writing because it has meaning. Consider reader experience and attention span. We kind of talked about this, but my best advice is to think about you. How do you consume content? How many screens do you scroll on Instagram before you get bored and move on to the next one? If you click on someone's website, how much time do you spend clicking around, looking for what you need? 
okay, now switch that and make it all about you, right? So that's what we want to think about. Again, it's not so much about what we want to tell them if we just put that broccoli out there, but putting it in a logical order, right? Is it, is it clear what you're talking about? Is the message clear to the reader? Is there a beginning, a clear beginning, middle, and end? And was the journey worth it? Like we said, if you just spent three seconds of your life reading that Instagram, or hopefully more, right? Or hopefully a couple minutes reading your statement, your essay, your press release, when they finish reading that, are they going to feel like they got something interesting, a good experience, information that they needed, that kind of thing. So we're always trying to make that journey worth it for them. And that brings That's us it. to the end. Thank you. Thank you.